Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. If I were to give this chapter a title, it would come with a warning. And what would that warning be? Beware to those who want to attack Israel. We see in the scripture a very close relationship, obviously a covenantal relationship between Israel and God. And even though Israel has suffered greatly, from the hands of her enemies and also, at times, because of the discipline of God. In the end, and I'm speaking about the last days, God is going to move, as we've talked about so often. He is going to pour judgment upon this world, and in doing so, He is going to reaffirm His relationship, this covenant with the sons of Jacob. And there will be a remnant of those who are still alive that are going to experience God's restoration by means of his redemption. And this is such an important principle. It is redemption that leads to restoration and a renewal back to the promises of God, the purposes of God. So once again, as we look at the prophecy of Isaiah, we see God moving in order to bring about judgment upon this world. Now, in our chapter that we're going to study, chapter 27, we see that there are strong indicators from this chapter that are found within the text that tells us that this chapter is not about the past, but about the future. More specifically, the last days, that final redemption that Messiah will bring about when he returns in order to set up his kingdom. And that principle that we have spoken of often, and that is judgment first, and that judgment ultimately will be a vindication for the remnant of Israel. It is that which must take place before the kingdom of God is established. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to chapter 27 of the prophecy of Isaiah. Now, this prophecy is difficult. When we read it, there is much that can confuse the reader. When we pay attention to the original language, there are things that go back and forth grammatically that can cause us to, to not be able to dogmatically render things with a, a clear understanding. But the big picture is most clear. So this will become more obvious when we begin this chapter, and let's do so. Look at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 1. That familiar expression, in this 27th chapter, which is only 13 verses, that expression on that day referring to judgment specifically in this context, that final day of judgment, it is going to appear, that expression, four times as we begin and also as we conclude this chapter. And that gives us a right context for knowing that throughout, not just in the beginning, not just at the end, but throughout this entire chapter, we're dealing with the last days. And notice what God's going to do initially in these last days, how he's going to bring judgment upon that great enemy. Who am I speaking about? Look at verse one. On that day, the Lord and most Bibles will say, visit. This is that word, 
Pei Kuf Dalit, that speaks about God being totally invested, Him acting in a mighty, in a thorough manner. And here, God is going to visit, but notice who He's visiting and why. He is going to visit the Lord with His sword. What type of sword? It is a sword that is strong, it is large or great, and it is hard, meaning it is not breakable. So God, we have an image here of God. And remember, it says in the first redemption, and what am I speaking of? The exodus from Egypt. You go back to Exodus chapter 15, and it says that, that God is a man of war. He fights the battle for his people. And here we have the image of him coming forth with this strong, large, and hard sword. And notice who this sword is upon. It is upon, and we're going to see the word, and I want to get it right because it speaks of a large, usually, sea monster, and it's the word here, Livyatan. Livyatan is, is known in the Hebrew language as a, a monster that comes from the sea that has, as we see, satanic connections. Now, we need to remember, for example, if you study the book of Revelation, chapter 13, we see that the beast comes out of the sea. That is an empire that comes out of great instability. The sea represents instability. So we look here and we see that God is bringing judgment upon this, this monster, this sea monster, and notice the next word that is used here, the word nachash. Nachash is a simple word for snake. And it's one of the words that is used to describe Satan in the Torah. So we see this, this monster is called also a snake. And not only that, but as we read, it's also the word bariach. Now, bariach, many people, in fact, many of the English translations, they see that this word is, a, is related to the root, livroach, which means to flee from a place, to, to leave rapidly from one location to another where the primary objective is simply to, to be gone, not remain. But this word also is a word that speaks of a, a bolt, a lock, like a deadbolt for a door which gives strength to that door. And this is a better translation. So it's not speaking about, about Satan fleeing, but rather it's describing this one who God is going to battle with, that it's this strong serpent or snake. And also upon this same word, Leviathan, this, this sea monster, this snake that is, and the next word speaks about it being twisted or that which perverts that which is right, that which is deceitful, that which is not uh, upright. And that describes Satan. He moves, he entices those people who are under his influence to behave in a crooked, not in a straight, upright manner, but he goes against that and leads others to do the same. And because of that, God, keep reading at the end of, of this verse, verse 1, he will kill thee, and this is a word that also appears in the Torah, for a serpent. So we have the word for snake, nechash, and then also here we have the word tanin, which is a serpent, also one of the words for the enemy, Satan. And it says, this serpent which is in the sea. So he comes out of the sea from a prophetic standpoint, out of the stance of instability, bringing about chaos, but in the end, God is going to go to battle with him with this great, strong, and large sword that he is going to kill the enemy. Verse 2. It begins the same way. 
Beyom Hahu on that day. And notice who the subject of, of verse 2 is. We have the word Kerem. Kerem is a vineyard. We've seen in Isaiah 5 that, that Israel is called a vineyard. And in other places, also in the New Covenant, we see that Messiah taught a parable where he likened Israel to a vineyard. And now we have to deal with a, a textual variant. Now, these are the type of variants that we see more often than not in the Scripture. When, when someone wants to attack the, the inerrancy of Scripture, the the Accuracy of Scripture, yes, because of men, and that men copied the Word of God. Occasionally, we see that there are different traditions of manuscripts. And what we have here is a debate whether this word is a word chemer or chemed. Now, it's the difference, the last letter being an R or a D in English, in Hebrew, a resh or a dalit. And one of the things that you may not know, if you know a little bit of Hebrew, at least the aleph bet, the alphabet, you will know this. Because the appearance of a resh and a dalit are very, very similar, these two letters. The only difference is there's on one side, there's a little bit on the dalit, a hanging over that's not there on the resh. Now, most scholars would see this, and you'll have to check out your Bible, but since the, the term that we have here is kerem, the word chemer speaks of a fine red wine. The word chemed comes from the word for desirable. It's a word to desire or covet something, that which is desired, that which is coveted. So here it speaks about Israel, obviously desirable, but I would argue as a fine red wine that comes from the vineyard. And then it says, Anu la. They will answer to her. And who's the they? The word here, Anu, some Bibles will say they will sing, but this word has nothing to do with singing. It's a response. And most of the, the ancient scholars of Judaism sees that the plural represents the, the heavenly court, those who assemble. If you read in the book of Daniel, it depicts just that. In Daniel chapter 7, for example, that the thrones are set up and the judges sit and they make this final decree about judgment that God through Messiah ultimately carries out. So when we look at verse 2, it speaks about this, this symbol of Israel, this fine or desirable wine that those in the heavens are going to speak concerning her to her. And what do they say? They speak about God's faithfulness. Look now at verse 3. I, the Lord, keep her. Now, this is a word that speaks about God keeping in a continuous sense. And it says that he does so, lir gaim. The word rega means a moment. Regaim, moments. And it speaks about God's faithfulness to keep Israel throughout all the different time allotments, all the epochs of time, that God has preserved that seed of Israel, that heritage of Jacob. So he says, I have preserved her for moments, meaning over and over throughout time. I have watered her, meaning he has nurtured her, he has cared for her, less he will visit upon her. And most see the one who is visiting here is not God, but rather, of course, it's the enemy. That the enemy is going to want to destroy Israel. Why? Because the enemy knows if he destroys Israel, then the purpose, the plan of God, what God wants to establish, meaning his kingdom, which is dependent upon Israel, it won't be done. 
And therefore, Satan believes if he can destroy Israel, he is going to destroy the purpose of God and his plans, his wants will be fulfilled. So God is saying here, I have watched out for Israel. I have kept Israel. I have nurtured. I have literally, it says, watered her less, less. He visits unto her. And then he says, night and day, it's that same word, I am keeping. And it's literally, in the future, I will keep her. But the point is that it goes continuously. Sometimes a future is used not just to speak about a future event, but something that is now on into the future. So God is speaking about his faithfulness. Verse 4. In regard to Israel, remember, this is judgment day, and God says, heat, and this is a word for anger, like being red hot angry. He says, Anger I do not have. And who will set me, set before me, and we have the word for shmir shayat, which is bristles and thorns and such. Now, this all would be hard to walk through. If you're in a field that's full of these thistles and briars and, and, and thorns, it's hard to go through. But God says, God says if this is the case, those who set before me these thistles and briars in war. He says, I will pass through and I will ignite them all together. So God is going to use the weaponry, what the enemy uses to defeat the purposes of God, hinder the things of God. God's going to use that against them for their judgment. And again, we see this in the scripture where the swords of the enemies are used not against God's covenant people, but they use themselves, the enemies of God, pierce one another. They are confused and they fight and destroy themselves and not the people of God. Verse, verse 5. Now, here we see an image of choice. Because he's saying and speaking about those who want to thwart who are opposed to the things of God, who want to go to war against the things of God. But in 5, he says, or, here's the alternative, or he can, he can hold on to my strength, my power. And it's kind of a play on words because we have two different words for strength or power. The word to hold on comes from a word which means to be strengthened. So I will be strengthened by the fact that I hold on to him and I have access through to him of his power. One who does that, it says, he will make peace with me and peace he will make with me. Now, the point here, if this is his objective to be at peace, and remember the word peace has to do with fulfilling God's will. If he takes hold of God, and obviously this is through a covenantal means, he makes a covenant, enters into a covenant of peace. What's peace? A desire to fulfill God's will. He's saying, God is promising, I'll work in this man. I'll work in that woman. I will empower and strengthen so that my will, in fact, will be, will be achieved. That's his promise, verse 6. Now, in verse 6, we have the Hebrew word ha-bayim. And most of the scholars see this as a reference to a phrase that repeats over and over in prophecy. We know the expression, in those days, or those days are coming in this future time. So ha-bayim has to do with coming, and most scholars believe that it's speaking about a future. In the coming days... What's God going to do? God is going to cause Yaakov, Jacob, to, to take root. And he will, he will blossom and flower. Who's that? Israel. So Israel. Israel will be a, a nation that, that blossoms and flourishes and fills the face of the world with its yield, with its produce, with its outcome. 
And what is Israel supposed to do? It is going to be turned into a nation, a kingdom. This creation is going to reflect righteousness. And it's the righteousness of God that is going to be manifested ultimately by means of Israel in that kingdom. It's God's righteousness. It's Messiah's righteousness. But Israel's called to reflect that. And in the kingdom, there's going to be that change. And that change is going to begin at the end of the last days. Verse 7. Now, verse 7 is a very hard verse to translate. Not because of the vocabulary. We have primarily two main words. The words la'akot, which means to strike, to make a blow, and the word for la'arog, to kill. So we have a striking, giving something a blow, or, or I should say, and the word for killing. But the grammatical constructions here are very difficult to be able to render into to English literally. And this is how most scholars see this. Look carefully at verse 7. It begins with a hey, that letter, and in this context, it puts it into a question form. And then we have is, that forms a question, is according to the blow that, that he hit it says, they were hit. And I put it, they, it's singular, but it's referring to the enemy of, of Israel or the enemies of God. And likewise, we see that same word or the same idea in verse, verse 7 in regard to, to killing. Or according to the, the dead, those who have been killed, is it the same as the ones of him who has been killed, that, that are killed. And what it's speaking about here is the enemy is not like God. The enemy cannot make a blow, a striking like God strikes, and cannot kill like God kills. Now, some of the scholars see it making a contrast between how God deals with Israel and how he deals with the nations. That, that even though Israel received a, a blow, it wasn't like the blow that, that he gave to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And likewise, the dead, even though a, a degree of number of, of B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, died, it wasn't like the dead of the enemies. What I would say about verse 7 is this. It speaks about the uniqueness of God, the superiority of God, the sovereignty of God, that the enemy cannot act as God acts, cannot bring about death as God brings about death, nor we can see it in the other ways that some translate it, that God makes a distinction between Israel and the nations. God doesn't deal with Israel like he does the nations. Why? One main reason. Covenant. Israel has a covenant, and if the nations would enter into that same covenant, that they would experience the same thing. So this is at the heart of verse 7. Now verse 8. In the same measure, and this is again showing the uniqueness of how God deals with his covenant people. In the same measure, that, that he sent her, goes back to Israel being feminine, in the same measure in which he sent them, sent them into exile and punished them. In that same way, he is going to contend for, for them. And he will remove, and some say this word that's here, haga. Haga can be, enunciating something, saying something, declaring something. Or it can be removing something. So either God's going to declare something with, notice the context here, with the, the harsh breath in a, a day of, of judgment. This word judgment represents the east. 
and usually judgment comes out of the east. Some will say the word spirit or breath has to do with a storm that he's going to bring out of the east. Either way, it's imagery in regard to judgment. So either he's going to remove by means of, and the word here, ruach, can be his spirit, whether it's his breath or, or wind, that God is going to proclaim and he's going to remove by means of his, his harsh spirit in the day of judgment. Now it will be, we'll see this in effect, that the spirit of God, that he will be harsh in judgment in the last days. Verse 9. Therefore, with this, with this, the iniquity of, of Jacob will be atoned. So here, God, he is going to, in the last days, do something. He is going to cover up. That's what the word atonement means. He is going to atone the iniquity of Jacob. And this, all the fruit will be removed of his sin. And here, fruit, all the outcome, all the implications of his sin is going to be removed. When he sets forth all the stones of the altar as the stones of, of chalk, which is very much like powder. And then we have the next word, which means to exploit, explode something into pieces. And we find that the Asherim and the, the Chachmanim, these are idols of worship. Things having to do with idolatry, items of false worship. And what it's saying is this. When Jacob is, is changed by God's grace, when he experienced God's atonement and God's forgiveness, and when's this going to happen? In the last days. And in that, there's going to be a change. He will rise up and make the stones of the altar like, like powder. He is going to, to destroy idolatry in the midst of the children of Israel in the last days. Verse 10. And in doing so, this, this empire is also going to be destroyed. Sometimes a city, if you read the book of Revelation, we talk about Babylon, how Babylon has fallen. And most scholars agree we're not speaking about Babylon literally, but the term Babylon being used, all, that, all the thoughts, the imagery that, that is conjured up when we hear that word Babylon and the Babylon captivity and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, how they came wanting to destroy the things of God, his people, his city and such. Now, God allowed it. God used it. But Babylon was a wicked people. And what God is saying here is that this fortified city, look at verse 10, for a fortified city, a stronghold of a city, this is this empire, is going to be alone. And the habitation is going to be sent forth, meaning there's not going to be any more people living in this place. It will be abandoned as the desert. And there the calf will, will graze, and there he will lie down, and he will consume. He is going to finish off all the branches, anything that, that could give nourishment, anything that has any resemblance of life, vegetation, life is going to be done away with. Verse 11. Now, verse 11 is a very powerful verse. And speaking about how, if you don't have faith in the promises of God, you are going to act in a way that is going to bring about your own demise. Look at verse 11. Speaks here about with dryness of the harvest. The, and the implication is the branches, the produce, whatever is broken. So when things become very dry, they become fragile if we're speaking about different types of vegetation. 
Remember, the context here is at the time of the harvest. So when that happens, when the vegetation becomes dry and brittle, what does it say? Women come, and they set fire to it, to the harvest. For this is not a people. Here it's a people of understanding. Therefore, he will not have mercy upon it, and the maker, the maker, will not uh, in any way show favor to that which he formed. So it speaks about a destruction. Why? Because the image is here. The women come and they take what seems to be dead and they burn it up. What don't they have faith in? The resurrection. They're not thinking about the age to come. They are seeing physical death and they say that's over and they take the, the, the outcome, the harvest that's dry and brittle. What's it good for? Just burn it up. So it's showing that they are going to participate in their own punishment, that they are going to act in a way that brings the judgment of God upon them. Verse 12. Two more verses. And they both began, verses 12 and 13, both begin just like verses 1 and 2 did, and that is with that expression, Be'yom ha-hu. Look at verse 12. And it shall come about in that day that the Lord, he will beat, he will hit, and this is word for, for threshing. You find uh, uh, wheat, and in order to get the kernel, the grain, the, the part that's, that's nourishing, you have to beat that. And it says, the Lord, he will beat, and here it is, the channels of the river. This can also be the, the wheat along the side of the river. Unto the river of Egypt. Now it uses two words, Nahar and Nahal. One is referring to, the scholars say, the, the Nile, and another one's referring to a Nahal, a smaller river that was known in Egypt. So it says, you will be gleaned, and it says, and use in the plural, you all will be gleaned one by one. And who's he speaking to? The children of Israel. So Israel, even though it's going to be Beaten, meaning it's going to go through what's called Jacob's trouble. A time of affliction and trials and hardship at the hand of the enemy. God is the architect. He's not the cause, but he's the architect, meaning this. He's going to use that in order to bring Israel to repentance. And the remnant, those who survive that, they are going to experience. God's going to gather them up one by one. Who's they? The children of Israel. Now verse 13. Once again, and it will come about on that day. And notice the language here. That the great shofar, that, that horn, the ram's horn, that speaks about God's provision for victory, a kingdom victory. It will come about on that day that he will sound the great shofar. And the perishing ones from the land of Assyria, they will come. And the outcasts in the land of Egypt, they also. And they all will bow down to the Lord on that holy mountain where? In Jerusalem. So God is going to not forget the outcasts of his people who are in Assyria and Egypt. Two places that represent suffering, great suffering, and also exile. And it's very similar to what we see in Matthew 24 and verse 31. In the last days when Messiah returns and with the sound of the shofar, he's going to gather his elect from the four corners, meaning north, south, east, west. Here it's speaking about gather them up from their enemies, these two great enemies in Israel's history. He is going to bring them 
in order that they might, notice what it says, that they will worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, holy in the past, and it has a holy and glorious future. So chapter 27, a great chapter in reminding us of what God's going to do, his faithfulness and fidelity to those who are in a covenantal relationship with him. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.